So um, before we turn to computing a simple formula for the um, optimal labor, the efficient labor market tightness, and um, I want to just show you how the business cycle shows up uh, on uh, this beverage curve diagram and what we can learn about the efficiency or lack of efficiency of business cycle fluctuation. So uh, we have our beverage curve still the same, US labor market 2010-2019. Uh, 10 years of data. Um, so, uh, so then we may wonder, okay, what's the efficient unemployment right here? So we know how to do it. If we have the social value of unemployment, if we have the roasting cost, we can you know, compute the slope of this ESO welfare curve, right? Uh, which is, uh, as we've seen, you know, given by um, minus one minus z divided by r, um, and then we can find the point of tangency of the ESO welfare curve and the beverage curve, and that gives us the uh, point of efficiency. So something like this. Um, so say, now let's go something like this. Um, so let's say this is. Um, Let's say that this is my ISO welfare curve. Um, the slope is a minus one minus z over r. Okay, right, and then we found the point of tangency, which we say here. So in a case like this. Um, we have an efficient unemployment rate, which is, you know, U star, which is maybe like 5% here, and an efficient vacancy rate V star, which is, you know, here, if we use that slope, it's like 3.5%, okay? So this is just an illustration. So we have that U star, we have that V star. Now, if, if we assume that um, the recruiting cost and the social value of unemployment are stable over the business cycle, then what we can, uh, so that, and um, you know, it would be hard to believe that the recruiting cost varies systematically over the business cycle because the way people recruit you know, sometimes you feel vacancy more quickly or less quickly, but the process of recruiting is always the same. Um, the value of unemployment, you know, there's no real reason to believe that, that it changes. So let's assume that Z and R are stable over time. Um, and, you know, we, we have no evidence to the contrary. There's not much evidence to push for that, but I guess um, it seems natural to start with that. So if we start, if we have this, if we have this, then the uh, then the ISO uh, welfare curve is also stable over time. Okay, so it means that here we have our beverage curve that's stable for a 10-year period. We have a, an ISO welfare curve that's also stable. So it means that the, in a case like this, the efficient unemployment rate would never move over time, okay, or at least over this 10-year period. Sometimes the beverage curve has a big shift, and, and then you have to, when it shifts, you have to shift the um, efficient unemployment rate and um, efficient vacancy rate. But here, over this 10-year period, the beverage curve is stable. The zero welfare curve will be scale stable. So the um, efficient unemployment rate will be very stable. But then we see that the actual the actual um, unemployment rate on the other hand, it moves very much. So say in bad times, we may be like somewhere here. So that's like an actual quarter you know, uh, that was realized during that decade. So this is U during that quarter. So you have U that's about you know, 8 eight percent. And so as you can see, when, when you're in a situation like this, what happens? Um, So what do we have here? Why do we have this? Um, 
So what do we see? We can see that in a situation like this, the actual unemployment rate is much bigger. The actual unemployment rate is much bigger than the efficient unemployment rate. So here we have what we call an unemployment gap. And here the unemployment gap is uh, positive. So we have an unemployment gap, which is u minus u star. And here u is much bigger than u star. You see it's maybe um, three percentage point bigger. But this is what we call when people talk about an unemployment gap. It's a gap between the actual unemployment rate and the efficient unemployment rate. And so you can see in bad times, so this would be like early in the decade, like maybe 2011, 2012, 2013, the unemployment rate was uh, very high, around 8%. We're still you know, kind of recovering from the recession. And so the unemployment gap was positive because the unemployment rate was much uh, higher than uh, the uh, efficient unemployment rate. But then as the economy is becoming uh, you know, hotter and hotter, the market is becoming tighter. At some point, we cross efficiency. So that was, you know, maybe in like 2016 or 17, just kind of on top of my head. And then the economy keeps tightening, keeps booming even more. And then our unemployment gap becomes actually negative, meaning that the unemployment is below uh, the efficient unemployment rate in that little illustration. So that would be something like something here. So that if you look at um, if you look at what happened at the end of the period 2018-2019, in that illustration, as you can see, uh, here in a case like this, the actual unemployment rate, so which is um, you know somewhere here, say. So in a case like this, you had an actual unemployment rate that was below 4%, and so the unemployment rate is um, below the efficient unemployment rate. So now you have an unemployment gap that's negative. So uh, an unemployment gap has opened. First, it's positive. Then it gets towards zero. And then in good times, it becomes negative. And so in a world like this, you can see that, um, you know, if the welfare curve is stable, which we think it is, and the beverage curve is stable, then basically over the business cycle, your unemployment gap is going to be sometimes positive in bad times. So it means you have too much unemployment from a welfare perspective. The unemployment is ineff inefficiently high. And then sometimes your unemployment gap would be actually negative. So then you have too little unemployment. So it's possible, you know, at least in that illustration, we do see that we may have an unemployment gap that's negative where you have too little unemployment. So basically your labor market is, um, is too hot, is too tight. Uh, in a world like that, you would like to cool it down a little bit. So to keep unemployment closer to 5%. Um, so 5% would see that we're not far from you know our best estimates of the efficient unemployment rate, so maybe a little bit high, but not uh, you know not not insanely so. So this is not a bad picture of what actually is going on in the U.S. labor market. That the unemployment rate fluctuates a lot. When it fluctuates, it's always deviation from the efficient unemployment rate. Sometimes we have too much unemployment, sometimes too little. Um, so this is very different from the picture that would come up in a neoclassical model where you know, unemployment would be, well, unemployment wouldn't exist, and if it did exist, it would be always efficient. Here you have sharp inefficiencies over the business cycle, which will, um, you know, which, which will um, justify implementing policies to try to stabilize the labor market, to keep unemployment closer to its efficient level. Uh, okay, so now the only issue here is that, um, you know, we need you know, so we need to have like many years of data to pl plot our beverage curve, and then we need to use this little uh, line to find the point of tangency, and then graphically we can compute unemployment gaps and that's sufficient unemployment rate. But what, what we want to do now, just to finish, is to actually find a formula in which we can plug statistics uh, that can give us actually what is the efficient tightness, how does it compare to the actual tightness to know whether your you know your uh, labor market is too tight or too slack and hence whether your unemployment rate is inefficiently high or inefficiently low. Uh, 